Wonderful. Shall we um, pray? Let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus, on this Sabbath day, we pray that you might bless us as we think about your word, as we think through how it might apply into our lives. Lord Jesus, would you help us to understand ourselves better today, we pray. And we pray that you do that work in us by the power of your spirit. For your glory we pray. Amen. Let me um, start by giving you three examples uh, to try and sort of explain what we're going to think about today. Uh, number one example, Leila Slimani, the best-selling author. She was writing in the Sunday Times magazine a couple of weeks ago, and this is what she wrote. She said, I need to understand my identity and explain how I am French and at the same time Moroccan, a Muslim woman who is integrated in all Western values. Who am I, she's asking. Who am I? What place does my race, does my religion, does my worldview have to my identity? Number two example, a teenager I chatted with in the church family this last week. Uh, they were worried about their sports trials coming up in their school at the start of term. You know, which team were they going to get into? They, I need to do well, they said. I, I must do well. I'm not going to be known for being clever at school, so I, I want to be known for being good at sport. Who am I? The teenager was asking, well, where do I get my value? Where do I get my approval? Where do I get my worth from? Number three example, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the wonderful German pastor who was imprisoned by the Nazis during World War II for his opposition uh, to what was going on. And two weeks before he was killed by the Nazis, he wrote a poem entitled, Who Am I? And the poem starts with lines about how other people often say how incredible he is, the way he copes with all the suffering of his imprisonment. But then he writes this. He says, am I then really that which other men tell of? Or am I only what I myself know of myself? Who am I? This or the other? Am I one person today and tomorrow another? Am I both at once a hypocrite before others and before myself a contemptible, woebegone weakling? Who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Who am I? Who are you? That is, if you like, the question that we are going to be looking at today. And, and very simply, we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at first our identity problem and then our identity solution. Now, the concept of identity is huge today. I think we probably all know that. You know, identity politics is the new big thing in our socio-political world. How do we understand identity? Now, first of all, it has multiple aspects. Things like our ethnicity, where we live, our achievements, our habits can contribute to our identity. Our sense of identity, it can be shaped by our childhood, by how we were parented, all sorts of things. In the past, perhaps people most got their, their sense of identity from their duties. The things that are found external to them. You know, my duty to my family, my duty to my work, my duty to my country. You know, who am I? I'm a British Army officer in World War II. Who am I? I'm a working mother. Who am I, says Leila Slimani? I'm a French Moroccan Muslim writer. Our identity is formed by our different duties. But increasingly, more and more, people get their sense of identity, not just from their duties, but also increasingly from their desires too. You know, things that are discovered, if you like, within ourselves. So I desire fulfillment. I desire to be in control of my life. I desire to be true to myself. I desire to be whoever I want to be. You know, most recently we see it in the, you know, the many email signature strips and Twitter profiles where people choose what pronouns they desire to be identified with. He, him, she, her, they, them, or indeed a host of non-binary pronouns, they, them. But here's the identity problem. Whether we are more getting our sense of identity from our duties or our desires, here's the problem. We are all building our identity on something. We're building on something that so often is not totally secure, that can crumble, 
Perhaps something bad happens to us outside of our control, a childhood trauma, an abuse, and it can end up defining us or governing our outlook on life. Perhaps we achieve in work, our identity is based on success, all built on our success, but then we lose our job and it feels like we've lost our identity. I've spoken to so many people when they've retired, actually they're questioning, who am I? Suddenly realizing that so much of their sense of identity was tied up in their work. Perhaps we get our sense of worth from our beauty, but then we get older and get more wrinklier. I know that. More and more people are telling me my hair is white, and I'm like, no, no, it's blonde. (laughs) Perhaps my desire to be whoever I want to be hasn't turned out at all how I'd hoped. Our identity is so often insecure and unstable. And I think we can begin to understand this identity problem more clearly when we turn to our Bible passage that Mariana read for us. This is week two of our our series, going through the first three chapters of the Bible, and we discover at the end of Genesis 1 that who we are is described in terms of an image problem. You see, our identity problem is an image problem. Not in the usual sense of the phrase, you know, so-and-so's got a bad, uh, a bad image problem that we need to try and sort out. How are we going to deal with that? I don't mean that. You know, what is an image? An image exists only in relation to the original, doesn't it? Uh, this is an image here. It's a stamp. That is an image. It's an image of the queen. And that stamp, that image of the queen, it is only possible because the queen exists. The queen is the original, the stamp is the image. And and you and I, we are all images. And we must therefore get our sense of significance, our sense of value, our sense of acceptance, our sense of worth from something outside of ourselves, from the original. We cannot stand alone. And so when we say ourselves, we say to ourselves, I am worthy because of this. I I am acceptable because I'm welcomed by them, this group. I am significant because of that. Well, whatever the this or the them or the that is, whatever they may be, they become the deepest reality about who we are. They are the original to which we look as the image. And our identity problem comes because so often the original from which our image is derived is something other than than God. We give ourselves to something else. And all those other things, they end up letting us down because we are looking outside of God, separate to God, for what only God can provide. Only God can provide ultimate security and value and significance and purpose. We try and build our identity on other things. When God, our original, he has already given us an identity. And we don't need to build an identity at all. So here is our identity solution. You and I, we are created in the image of God. God is the original from which our image is derived. Because to ask who am I is to ask whose am I. What is the original that I am an image of? And God says, whose am I? I'm his. You are his. Look at verse 26. Look at verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Look again at verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. It couldn't be clearer, could it? Four times in two verses, we are told it. If you think back to the whole of the Genesis 1 account, everything else in Genesis, it keeps on being said, has been made according to its own kind, but we are made according to God's kind. We are made in his image. So you can study animal behavior as much as you like. You can fill your boots with Netflix documentaries on chimpanzees if you would like, but they will never fully explain what it is to be human because we are far more than a relatively hair-free ape. Some of us are quite hairy, but most of us. Um, But so what? So what? 
How does you and I being made in the image of God, how does that make a difference to you and me? How is it our identity solution? Well, last week we saw, we saw that Genesis 1, it's not so much focused on the sort of chronological order. It's not focused on the, the when and how our world was created, but it's focused more not on the chronological order, but creation order. It's focused on why this world has been created by God. And we saw above all that God has created us, you and I, he's created us in a certain order for us to have certain loving relationships within his creation. And therefore, how our relationships work, that is key to what it means for you and I to be made in the image of God. Let's see four of those relationships. First, our relationship up to God. If you look at Genesis 1, 28, it says, God blessed them, humans, and he said to them. Now, you'll remember, God has spoken again and again and again throughout creation. We, we hear, and God said, let there be light, and it was so. God said, and it was so. God speaking, it, he speaks in power. But here, it's different. For the first time, in verse 28, God is speaking to somebody else, and he is speaking relationally. He's not just sort of speaking out there into the ether as he creates. He is speaking relationally. And that shows us that you and I, we are dependent on God. We need to be in relationship up to him. And I want you to recognize this. We don't just need to be in relationship up to God because we sin because we muck up, because we need saving. That is true. But this is Genesis 1, isn't it? This is before sin enters the world in Genesis 3. We, unlike all the rest of creation, we are created to be in relationship up to God. And it's why, when you get a few verses later, Genesis 2, verse 2, day 7 of creation, it's why God rests from his work. Not because, you know, God has done this six days of creating and he's a bit exhausted. He needs to put his feet up and have a gin and tonic. It's not that at all. No, God rests day seven because he has finished the whole purpose of creation. The whole purpose of human beings, us, made to be in a perfect relationship to him, our creator. Uh, Dag Hammarskjöld was the second ever um, Secretary General of the United Nations back in the 1950s. And he once said this. He said, I became a Christian to become a man. I became a Christian to become a man. He was saying he had become more fully human by coming to faith in Jesus. And he had understood Genesis 1. We are more as God intended us humans to be when we are in relationship up to him, the image in relationship with its original. Second, our relationship down to the world. As humans, we are told here to rule over the rest of creation. We're told that verse 26 and verse 28. We're told to subdue it. So the lion, it may be the king of the jungle. The orangutan, it may be the king of the swingers in the jungle book. Uh, but neither of them are to be kings over this world. Us, being made in the image of God, we are to be like God as we rule over the earth. Now, that is not an invitation to environmental irresponsibility. That is not to rule like God. This is a delegated dominion. God has instructed us to rule this world on his behalf. This dominion, it should have nothing to do with domination or destruction. Uh, we are accountable to God for our stewardship of this world. We are caretakers of the world. We are called to be managing it responsibly for our sakes and for the future generation's sake. So, you know, the COP26 UN Climate Change Conference at the end of October in Glasgow, that is an important thing because God calls us as his image bearers to be wise stewards of this planet. Third, our relationship across to others. Look at verse 27 again. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So it's saying there that one sex is not inferior to the other. And that is perhaps the main example of the wider principle that every human being is of equal value. Because we are all, whoever we are, we are all made in the image of God. So there should be no place for sexism. 
but also no place for racism, nor classism, nor homophobia, nor modern-day slavery. And that the simple principle that all humans are of equal value it is huge in its repercussions. Just think about it in discussions about disability, in discussions about euthanasia, in discussions about abortion. Now, I know those are controversial subjects. I know I don't have time to sort of to unpack all the different angles on it. But if all humans are of equal value, why are many rightly concerned about the people of tomorrow being of equal value and needing to be protected when it comes to the environment, but not so concerned about the people of tomorrow being of equal value and needing to be protected when it comes to abortion? And vice versa, why are some concerned about abortion and not the environment? Now, it's certainly not my right as a man to stand here and tell any woman what to do with their body. But if we are all made in the image of God, it makes every single one of us here, male and female, it makes us responsible and accountable to God over how we treat other people made in his image. When the truth is, so often we just want to be accountable to ourselves. Professor Wayne Grudem, who's the professor of theology and biblical studies, he writes this. He says, every single human being, no matter how much the image of God is marred by sin or illness or weakness or age or any other disability, still has the status of being in God's image and therefore must be treated with the dignity and respect that is due to God's image bearer. Uh, Sally Phillips, the actress in Bridget Jones, Miranda, Smack the Pony, who's got a child who has Down syndrome. She said this, My blood runs cold when I hear the great news that we have found a marker for the Down syndrome gene, which means we can identify it more easily. Why is that good news? It's only good news if you're going to terminate. Quite frankly, if we discard the belief that we are all created in the image of God from the womb to the tomb, then we end up with terrifying consequences. More broadly, think what James writes in his letter in the New Testament. This is James 3, verse 9. He says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. That same phrase. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. You see, there are divisions in this world. Perhaps the most important division is the one between those who accept and reject Jesus. But over it all, we are united as human beings, whoever we are. And so if our identity, if it is primarily based on our achievements, or based on our goodness, or based on our race, or based on our sexuality, rather than on what God has given us by us being made in his image, then the danger is, if we're basing our identity on the wrong things, the danger is we are hostile to, we look down on, we curse with our tongues those who are different from us. But if our identity, if it is based above all on the fact that we have all, everybody, we have been made in the image of God, then that will dominate how we relate across to others, even those who think very differently from us, even those who believe different things, even those who attack or persecute us. Every human being, every human being made in the image of God, precious, valuable, to be loved. And then finally, Finally, our relationship in to ourselves. Now, this weekend, it has been a big weekend for sport, hasn't it? Emma Raducanu, what an amazing performance. Our fellow South Londoner, you see what I've done there, linking my identity with hers. We're all, all you know, fellow South Londoner, we're all together in a group. Um, amazing. You know, her performance, it has eclipsed uh, the performance of Cristiano Ronaldo back in a Man United shirt, scoring two goals uh, yesterday. But Cristiano Ronaldo back for Man United, it reminded me of that, uh, that um, tragic uh, statue that was um, unveiled of Cristiano a couple of years ago. I don't know if you remember, it's coming up there. It's not too flattering, is it? This statue of Cristiano Ronaldo. And as you look at that, I wonder if for many of us, we feel a bit like that statue. Now that statue there, it's an image, isn't it? That statue is an image. 
It's an image based on the original, Cristiano CR7 himself, but an image, that statue, that is rather marred, rather distorted, not a perfect representation of the original, I think that's fair to say. Now, do you feel like that statue? I do. Our sin, our sin, it mars, it distorts all those four relationships for us. As God's image, you and I, we don't represent God perfectly to the world, just as the Cristiano statue does not perfectly represent him. But you know, there is a man, a human being, who is the perfect image of God. Not a distorted image in any way. And his name is Jesus. And just a few verses before the verse that we looked at last Sunday, where Paul quotes Genesis 1-3, letting light shine out of darkness. Paul talks twice about Jesus as this image of God, this perfect image of God. And just have a look. It's going to come up on the screen at 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Paul writes this. He says, and we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. He's saying as you and I, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, the perfect image of God, so the Holy Spirit transforms us more and more into the likeness of Jesus. And that transformation, it is seen in how these four types of relationship are restored, renewed in our lives. The, the relationship up to God, down to creation, across to others, in with ourselves. But here's the bottom line. However sin distorts our image, however it does that, it does not obliterate the image your status, my status as being made in the image of God, it does not change one bit. It is fixed. We may feel like that Cristiano Ronaldo statue, but we are still fully made in the image of God. That status, it is given for every single human being, and it makes every single one of us, regardless of our gender, our race, our background, our achievements, the verdict of what other people say on us, it makes each one of us of unique value and worth. Most of us, we are only too aware of the way the image of God, it is marred and it is distorted in ourselves and the, the way we do those four relationships, Pauline. And the danger is that when we're aware of that, we're tempted to look outside of God for the significance and the value that only God can provide for us. And because of that, because we are so often, we're so tempted to build the core of our identity on other things rather than God. We try and build on our talents or our desires or our sexuality or our looks or our race or our job. Those things become the original. They become the original on which our image is based. And because of that, what do we do? We end up putting masks on ourselves to hide the real me with all the ways that I feel I'm marred and distorted and a failure. We fear that we won't be loved if people knew the real me, who I really am. But you know, the wonderful message of the gospel is that whether we are tempted to hide behind impressive achievements or our perfectly curated Instagram feed, whether we're tempted to hide behind makeup or a stiff upper lip, the one who is the perfect image of God, he knows us. He knows the real us with all our mars, with all our distortions, and he still died for us. When Jesus Christ, the perfect image of God, when he died on the cross, he was marred and distorted so that we who are marred and distorted by sin, our sin, other people's sin, so that we can know the joy, the freedom, the wonder, the security of what it is to be made in the image of God, to know that he is the original from which our image is derived. To ask who I am is to ask whose I am. Who or what is that original? And whilst all sorts of other things in our lives, they have a place, they have an influence on who we are. 
If you and I, if we give ultimate allegiance to anything other than God, then it will let us down. They are not solid foundations. As I close, remember the incredible Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his poem, Who Am I? Written just two weeks before he was killed for opposing the Nazi rule. I didn't actually read you the very last line of his poem. This is how the poem finishes. He says, who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, thou knowest, O God, I am thine. You see, whoever you are, whatever different influences are in your life, Whatever different duties and desires are part of who you are. If you want to know deep, joyous freedom, if you want to know deep-seated security, if you want to know a value and a significance that never disappears, if you want to know an ability not to be too puffed up when everything's going well, nor too pulled down when things seem to fall apart, well then please, may the thing you most fundamentally trust in May the thing that you give yourself to above all, may the thing that you build your life upon, may the original from which your image is derived, may it be God. Whoever I am, thou knowest, O God, I am thine.